Hello, and welcome back to part D. And the saga continues. I was getting set up to start the alignment video, and this has started happening. Now, it did that several times when I first turned it on, when I started this whole journey. But I touched up a couple solder joints and it didn't happen for a long, long time. Now it's back. And it's basically anywhere I touch this thing now. It's not the antenna. It's not the voltmeter lead. It, that's just wiggling the chassis. And it doesn't matter where I poke. It's so sensitive. It's not the volume control. And I suspect, you can see. Did that a couple times moving it around on the table when I first got it. Like I say, I thought I'd fixed it. I have considered it, or considered that it could be a tube, one of the elements coming loose or are starting to short. So I shotgunned all the tubes. It's a brand new set of tubes in the radio. The original ones are over there. And it made absolutely no difference. So it's not a tube. And I've hit so many red herrings. I found a loose screw on this. these trimmer capacitors. Tighten that up. I thought I had a bad solder joint here. I've repaired that. doesn't matter where I touch this thing and I've been working at this for like 20 minutes now trying to gently prod every connection in here this is just some of the stuff you end up struggling with with these sets so I'm not going to bore you with the entire process but I just wanted to see some of the things you can get up against when I find it You know, that looks like it there, but that could be, you know, doesn't matter where I touch it. And I've grounded this to this. It's not that. And my first thought was this was wiggling in the frame. Makes no difference. Anyway, I'll be back when I figure it out, and I'll let you know what I found. Oh, hello, by the way. Hello and welcome. I think I may have narrowed it down. Right now, it's not making any noise. But if I put this cable back in here... Oh, now it's not doing it. Before, every time I did that... We found it. I think this choke. Oh, there goes my filament, my heater. I'm running on the uh, Heathkit power supply right now so that there's no vibrator noise. The only thing that's running off the big power supply is the heaters and the tubes. Yeah, I think it's right there. I think it's that choke is rubbing on this antenna lead. That's exactly what it is. Holy cow. I've been chasing this. Well, I don't know what time it is, but I've been chasing this for a long time. But you saw, no matter where I touched, get rid of that little piece of wire. These are the intermittent problems that will make you nuts. Problem solved, I believe. We're going to move on. Oh, okay. I think we're all set to go. Um, 
No sooner do I go to do something, the phone rings. Um, we're going to take the voltage readings from here and verify that all the voltages are correct. I did run through this before I had the paperwork, and the voltages looked okay, but I want to verify to their chart. Now, they're calling for 264 volts on the uh, cathode of the OZ4 and all of those voltages up here are based on that and they're calling for a thousand ohms per volt voltmeter now my triplets are twenty thousand ohms per volt and most of the digital ones are over eleven mega ohms but i do have a one thousand ohms per volt meter here that i made several years ago because uh, i needed it for a couple of other radios old radios to call for a thousand ohms per volt and uh, okay. let me see what the we have the DC power supply coming in here the tubes are all warmed up so I'm gonna flip on the power supply fixed 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 so let's start with the DC voltage supply 264 I guess you can see that meter. That's 200 and 246, 260, close enough to 264 for me. Uh, okay, the screen grid on the 6V6 should be 217. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, screen grid. About 210 close enough just 217 with these can be all plus or minus 10 percent or so the anode on pin 3 should be 250 1 2 3 240 a little bit low but not terrible uh, that's heater cathode should be 11.5 and the cathode is pin 8 it's over 10 so there's 10 yeah it's 10 point uh, 10 11 about 12 yeah close enough okay the cathode's looking good that means the tube's drawing the right amount of current. We come over here. The plate on the 6SQ7 should be 75 volts. That's on pin seven, uh, 876. 876. Yeah, scared me. What did we say it was supposed to be 75? Ooh, that's a little low. That's 64. So I'm going to write that down. 64. That resistor I thought checked out okay. Maybe I ought to take another look at it. And, uh, and here's a chuckle let me get for you. Meter. I've been texting back and forth with the owner. Hey Thomas, how you doing? And uh, looked at my homemade meter here. And I said, gosh, that's a mighty close match for the paint on the radio. I wish I could remember what I painted that thing with. That was quite a while ago. That was a rattle can of some kind. But uh, once the whole thing was painted, you'd never know. We'll find something, buddy. <laughs> now, that resistor with the plate is supposed to be 220K. And it did measure about 230, I remember, but now it's measuring that it's been run for a while. It's measuring about 290. So I suspect it's going bad inside. And it had a little current run through it. So I'm going to change that out and we'll take another look at that uh, anode voltage. The anode voltage here is on pin 6 and it's fed with that 220k resistor and this is one of those schematics that will bite you in the butt it's labeled 220M 
and that's not meg ohms because over here you see it says 15 meg 220m means 220k this is one of those early schematics that'll bite you if you're not careful and we've got a 2.2 meg ohm here and we have a 330m here that's 330k so just keep that in mind when you're working with these old sets we're going to get that resistor changed. Okay, I wasn't expecting anything spectacular change, and we went from 64 to 68. And they're calling for 75. But we'll mark that down. We'll keep that in our minds. 68 volts. Uh, 6SK7 RIF amplifier. On the plate, we should have 217. That's on pin 8. It's the, no, I guess the meter. Yeah. Try to get everything in frame here. There we go. I think that's better. Pin number 8. And we've got 210 ish. Pretty close to 217. Pin 876, the screen grid should be 71. So 876, the screen's there. We've got 70, so that screen grid is fine. The cathode, 1.5 to 5.4 volts. So that's pin 5. 8765. Uh oh. Am I doing something wrong here? 1.5, 5.4. And there's nothing there. Absolutely zero. Uh, let's take a look at the schematic. Oh, there's a potentiometer in that circuit to set that cathode voltage. Alright. Cathode. Right there is that pot. Okay, let's see what happens. Get back on the right pin here. Right there. And what'd they say? It's supposed to be 1.5 to 5.4. Let's see if that pot is just dirty. Am I hiding the meter? Is it in frame? Yeah. Show you my back of my bald head for a minute. Oh, that's all the way to the end of travel in one direction. There's 1.5. There's 2. Let's see. Let's set it. Let's go for the middle of the range for now. 1.5, uh, 2.5 volts. 2.5 volts is close enough. Hmm. So, with that cranked all the way to one end, I'm guessing somebody was in there with their golden screwdriver. Let's see if any of our other voltages have changed now. Gotta keep telling myself there's 260 volts here, 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 here. You get complacent, A, working on transistor gear, and B, those uh, All-American 5s only have 120 volts in them. Alrighty, where were we? Uh, our screen should be 71 still. One, two, three. Dropped a little bit. Of course, that makes sense. The tube's pulling more current now. 
217 on the plate. Still around 210, so that's good. The 6SA7. 217 on the plate. One, two, three. Pin one, two, three. About 210, that's good. And the screen should be 71. It's reading about the same as the other screen and the other tube. A little bit low. Come down here to our RF oscillator. Plate 155, pin 8, 155. 155, 50, 60, 70, 80, 190, that's a little high. Uh, 71 on the screen. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Now all the screens are looking a little bit low. And the cathode should be 0.8. Right on the money. Perfect. Those numbers don't scare me. I'd say we're pretty close. The screens are a little low, but I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, our voltages are all right, except for that one cathode that was way off. You also, one must plan for the twists and turns. Considering we're down in the basement and that antenna is not extended out, it's only on the first section. It sets pretty hot. It does a pretty good job of pulling signals in. Ah, uh, what am I doing here? I don't want to use the Chevy knobs. I don't want to flip this thing over and take a chance on breaking one. Let's see if we've got a couple of cheapos that we could stick on here. Yep, that works. Not working out. That's the wrong size. I just don't want to flip this thing up on its face and break those knobs. Probably it was rare as hen's teeth. You wouldn't believe what they're getting for knobs today. They're asking fifteen, twenty dollars a piece for some of them. And the only reason I'm looking for them is when I reach up and grab the antenna. I'm also holding this and I'm grounding the antenna. What's that? Will that work? Nope. My knob supply is getting pretty sparse. Yeah, that'll work. That way I don't have to worry about his Chevy knobs. Yeah, there's a lot of stations in there. Executive position like a VP. The life threatening disease that worsens over time, so it's important to recognize the signs. There's just so many noisy things in here. All right. Oh, didn't put one of the knobs back. Um, let's tip this back. Now, I was in here the other night when I originally did the video and marked all the alignment points. These radios are a little bit different than we're, we're used to. 
Let's, uh, oh, there we go, now we're in frame. Uh, in fact, let me grab another radio here. Just for a second. Yeah, had to edit that sneeze out. It wasn't fast enough on the button. <clears throat> okay. On these sets that we're used to playing with, we've got a tuning condenser, and we have a couple of patter capacitors here on better or more sophisticated sets there'll also be either be a patter on the oscillator coil or there could be a slug in there that's adjustable and if you have both of those with a set that tunes primarily with capacitance you will typically go to the low end of the band someplace down around 600 and adjust the slug in the oscillator coil or the patter that's on the coil and then go up to a, some place up high on the dial and net it in with the patter on the tuning condenser on the oscillator excuse me and you'll go back and forth back and forth until you either expand or shrink the, the uh, scale or the spread so that it matches the dial scale on a set like this that doesn't have any patter or adjustment on the oscillator the best you can do is go for the high end alignment or like I did on this one a little bit high on that end and a little bit low on this end so that the spread works out you know fairly uniformly across the uh, dial face on a lot of these sets you'll see I think that's in frame. You can probably see the slices or the cuts in this plate. One, two, three. And you'll notice that plate is spread out a little bit, as is this one. Now, this happens to be the antenna section on this one. This is what trims the antenna into resonance. Don't play with those. That was done at the factory. And the reason it's spread like that and tapers down to a, a narrow section here and a narrow section on the back that's done for tracking purposes no capacitor is exactly linear when they tune from one end to the other so at the factory they'll sit down and they'll spread out the you know these outer plates that's why the cuts are in there and they'll spread those out to try to make the tracking of the antenna tuner and in some cases you'll find them on the oscillator as well in some of the big radios they may be on the oscillator and you can see they're turned out at the end here. That's to lower the capacitance ever so slightly on this end of the, of the uh, what do you want to call it? The, when it's fully meshed, it lowers the capacitance slightly. My suggestion is don't play with those unless you have infinite patience. That's a very touchy, tricky thing to do and you'd have to keep checking the thing at multiple points up and down the dial over and over and over until you net that in and especially on a set like this it just isn't worth playing with it just leave the plates alone don't bend them do the best you can with the patter that's here and or the one on the oscillator and call it a day but on this it's capacitance for the high end and ductance for the low end that's on this type of a set Now, these radios, let me get a clipboard so I don't keep flopping the paper. Okay, on this type of radio, these are permeability or permeability, depending on where you come from, tuned. And that means there's a coil with a slug that moves in and out and changes the inductance of the coil. That's how the, these tune. Now these have an advantage of being able to have a very linear tuning uh, spread. Uh, the military R390, for example, is so linear over its tuning range, it uses all this type of tuning 
That's an old military set that they actually had a mechanical digital readout on the front of it and it was fairly accurate. You know, you could go up and down the dial and as the numbers rolled up on this mechanical counter, the frequency was very accurate because they used this type of tuning in them. And there's various ways to make it linear or various ways to make it uh, increase in rate, say at the high end of the frequency range the windings might be further apart, on the low end of the frequency range they might be closer together so that as the slug goes down in it has a more linear motion up towards the low end of the band. This is an art and a science uh, doing these types of or designing these radios. I, my hat's off to the engineers who did this. But unlike our simple capacitor tuner that just tunes one gang for the oscillator and one gang of the capacitor for the antenna. This radio, this particular set has three tuning sections and some have many more and we'll look at one in just a second here. This one tunes the oscillator up and down and on these radios you tune the slug for the high end, you tune the inductor for the high end of the band and then you come down to the low end of the band and trim it slightly for the low end of the band and go back and forth. It's the same process. You go back and forth, back and forth until you net the two frequencies into the where you want them on the dial. But you have to remember with these radios you start with the high frequency end it's going to be the slug instead of the trimmer capacitor. On the low end it'll be the trimmer capacitor instead of the coil. <clears throat> This also tunes the anode circuit of the RF oscillator. This radio has an RF oscillator. So in conjunction with tuning that, this has to be tuned to track with it. But there's a caveat there. Very often they'll have you peak this at like 1600 kilohertz and this one will be peaked at 1400 kilohertz. They do that so there's a little bit of uh, a spread or a flatter response curve across the tuning range. And like our capacitor tuned radio, there's also a tuning section for the antenna circuit, but again, it's tuned with a slug, and they'll typically have a different set of frequencies they want you to net this into. So you've got sometimes three or even four different sets of frequencies, pairs of frequencies that you have to dial these different sections into. These can be very very time consuming to align and not having done them in several years I stumbled around in here for a while the other day and I'm probably going to stumble around in here again tonight. This radio, whoop, this radio here this is a Pontiac 1946 Pontiac and this radio has got one, two, three, four tuning sections along with the, you know, the standard IFs are just like our, our normal radio we just inject into the um, converter or mixer or whatever you want to call it. They have different names for it. This one's called a detect first detector oscillator. Uh, on our set it's called an oscillator modulator. On today's radios they call them the pentagrid converter they all mean the same thing. They all do the same function. They serve as the oscillator function and the mixer. <clears throat> but this one has four tuning sections. And down here you can see they want you, after we've, after we've netted in the IF section, they want you at 1645 to turn E, F, G, and H. And where the heck is E, F, G, and H? I can't make it out. Oh, E, there it is. E, F, G, and now see this is this is telling me just the opposite. This is telling me the high end to net in the tuning capacitor. Where most permeability sets, that's just the opposite. Holy crap. I was gonna give you an example here, and this thing's biting me in the ass already. Then they have you jump to 1620 kilocycles and do I, J, K, and L. And where's okay? So we're still up on the high end of the band I, J, K, and L. So we're going to tune those in on the high end of the band. So we are tuning the permeate the uh, 
the inductors. Then we jump to 1200 kilohertz and do JKL. So we go back here and do JKL over again. And then we go to 600 kilohertz and do FGH and FGH, that's the trimmer patterns down at the low end of the band, like I initially said. I could, they got us jumping around all over the place on this thing. <clears throat> and then we go back to 1200 kilohertz and do JKL. And then you start at the beginning and go through it again and start at the beginning and go through it again and start at the beginning and go through it again until you can't get much more improvement in the alignment. And it's a lot of work. It sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It's tedious. But because these sets are in such a harsh environment and they have such a limited antenna, even that big long antenna you pull up on the car compared to you know 100 feet of wire that you could string up at the house, that's a very short antenna for the wavelengths involved especially when you're 30 40 miles away from the station so the RF amplifier has to work at its peak efficiency hence the reason there's tuning in the plate circuit and in the grid circuit at the antenna so the RF amplifier is running at peak performance for whatever uh, frequency you have it tuned to and then we have to swing our oscillator so that we get our conversion like any other radio uh, where you've got your uh, oscillator has a double grid that uses for the anode and our RF signal here gets fed into the grid that's in between these two and it mixes and we get our IF which in this case is 262 kilohertz. I hope I didn't run through that too fast. I get uh, I get a little anxious because I know the time is going to run fairly long. But again on these, you, tend, you tune the slugs at the high end of the band and the trimmer capacitors at the bottom end of the band. The only tuning information I could find on this radio is it says use permeability tuning procedures. And does it say it on here? Uh, uh, taking a socket, plate, current drain. No, I saw it on a piece of paper somewhere for this set. It just says use tuning you know use permeability or permeability tuning um, procedures start at the high end adjust the coils start at the low end adjust the trimmers or go to the low end and, and adjust the trimmers and I suspect what did I do with the other one I suspect the reason the other one has us doing the trimmers and the coils at the high end is to get them netted in close to one another so that when we go to the other end there's only going to be a small amount of uh, trimming to do to net in the low end because if the thing's way out of alignment you'd have a hard time figuring out you'd be jumping back and forth many many times so I think their procedure on that last one that we just looked at is designed to have you net in the frequency with both the uh, inductor and the trimmer so that they're very close together so that that circuit is resonant close to its optimum tuning peak and then have you move down to the low end of the band and just offset the capacitor a little bit to net in the bottom and then we'll go back to the top and move the coil a little bit just to bring the top back in then we'll go down low and bring the bottom back in but it gets tricky because if you're not doing the same thing if you just try to concentrate on the oscillator you'll get outside of the tuning range of this and the signal is going to keep dropping off and dropping off and dropping off so while you're doing this you have to chase it with this and you have to chase it with that to make sure that everything is kind of staying in step so that all the tuning sections line up when you're finished I hope that makes sense I hope uh, I'm not stumbling around too much here It's a long, long, tedious procedure, and I'll get set up and try to net it in a little bit and then take you through some of it. So let me get everything hooked up. Let me get my signal generator out here uh, connected up, and we'll start with the IF section. And I'm going to cheat. Rather than hooking up a voltmeter, well, I'm going to be hooking up a voltmeter of sorts. 
I'm going to be using that voltmeter right there. That's a voltmeter with a time base. And the reason I'm using that is to get an analog meter, um, I like my triplet to deflect enough uh, on the audio signal. We got to have the speaker cranked up to where it's deafening. Up above over here, I have a Heath kit. Let's see if I can get my finger near it here. There's a Heath kit v, uh, FET VOM. It's like a VTVM, only it's an FET meter. It has a 1.5 volt lower scale, which works very nicely for tuning like this, but I can't get that in frame along with the radio, but I can easily get the oscilloscope in frame with the radio, and we'll see a representation on the screen. It's the same thing as doing it with a meter. I'm just not going to be blasting your eardrums with the volume turned up all the way. We'll get a visual represent, representation there. Instead of a needle swinging back and forth, it'll be the height of the waveform. Let me get everything all I knew set I wasn't up. Completely lo losing it. The circuit used in this receiver is the superheterodyne type, employing the permeability method of tuning. That's about the only information we can get. So I'm going to use the frequencies suggested with that other radio, and we'll see where we get. Let me get. Set. Alrighty. Now I know this is blasphemy, but. Uh, we're using a Hewlett Packard signal generator. I know, I know, I should be using the stuff upstairs. Sorry guys, I need the power supply down here. And yes, I'm using a time domain voltmeter. Sorry. <laughs> you can use your analog meter and I use them as well. It's just that this I can get into frame very easily or far more easily. This is nothing but an attenuator, so I can lower the signal level without jumping up and getting in front of the camera every time I make an adjustment. Uh, this is absolutely not necessary. You just keep turning down the signal level on your signal or the level on your signal generator. Everybody knows that. But this is just allowing me to do that remotely. And we have our signal generator up there. It's, as you can see, on 262 kilohertz. 30% um, modulation, 400 hertz tone. And what we're going to do, or what I am doing at present, is I am injecting on pin 8 of our converter tube. That's our grid that goes into our mixer. That's coming out of this, and it's going through the two IF sections, and I'm simply going to go down just like any other radio and peak the IF. Uh, there's no difference between this set and any other set as far as that goes in this procedure. So we'll come back over here and see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to dial in some attenuation. And I did go in here and intentionally detune this just for the purpose of doing this demonstration. And I just keep lowering the signal level so that I don't get into the AVC or automatic volume control action. but I'm running out of attenuation, so I'm gonna to have to get in front of the camera here. Uh, excuse me. And I'll take some of the attenuation out, take a lot of the attenuation out, and drop the signal generator again. And maybe one more time. There we go. That's a usable signal. We'll go up here to the next IF. You can see that works just as good as the voltmeter method does. And you can tell the jitter is 
noise that's starting to come in, that system noise in the radio, we're getting down, the level is getting down to the point where we're starting to get close to the noise floor of the intermediate frequency amplifier section. If I was to put this same signal into the antenna, it'd blow you out of the room because we have an RF amplifier in the front end and it'll amplify this. Do they give us? No, they don't give us the stage gains, but I'll bet it amplifies it at least a hundred times by the time it gets to this point. And I think we've pretty much come to the Maximum we're going to get out of this guy as far as the IF goes. Yeah, you can hear the hissing in the background. We're pretty close to the noise floor of the. Uh, What happened? There we go. And that's just, the jitter is just noise because the signal level going in now is so low that the amplifier is just adding its own noise in. There's just nothing there for it to amplify anymore. If I go up to a higher level, you see it settling down more and more and more. And as the signal level goes down, it'll get more and more jittery. So, that's the IF tuned up. Now I'm going to take my 001 capacitor off, and I'm going to go to a 75 picofarad capacitor. And the reason I'm going to a 75 picofarad capacitor is I'm going to be connecting to the antenna terminal and your antenna, your whip antennas, your standard pull-up antennas on most of the older cars run somewhere between eh, 30 to 100 picofarads, maybe 50 to 100 picofarads of capacitance. They're very capacitive because they're very short. And uh, so they run about 75 picofarads, so this emulates the antenna going into the system fairly well. And by the way, um, when you get the radio, there's a hole down here on the bottom. That hole is for trimming your antenna. You tune the radio. I'm going to tune it here. You know, I'm going to get it real close. But the final antenna tuning has to be done in the car. You put the receiver in the car, set everything up, turn it on, get it operating, and you tune to a station around 1400 kilohertz up near the top of the band, a weak, the weakest station you can find up there. And then you just take a little screwdriver and you adjust this trimmer for maximum signal strength. This was a common adjustment that uh, everybody did when they put a car radio in or had some work done on their car radio. When it came back from the shop, the first thing you would do hook your antenna up, tune your radio up to the 1400 kilohertz end of the dial and peak this little trimmer down here to get the maximum signal. It, it matches the antenna to the radio if you will. Because every car radio antenna is a little bit different and the coaxes are different length running to the radio. This just allows you to get that last little bit of tuning so you're getting the maximum effect out of your antenna system. Now I'm going to move over to the antenna and we're going to start trying to uh, do the normal alignments on this. Okay, just a minute or a couple minutes ago I said that the antennas are capacitive because they're tiny. And I know somebody out there is going, oh those things are almost five feet tall when they're pulled all the way up. That's tiny. Let's put things into perspective. When the radio wave leaves the antenna, Okay, I want the physics professors to go take a chill pill here for a minute because we're going to be talking for to put perspective to the antenna's uh, size. <clears throat> when it leaves the antenna traveling at the speed of light, 
one wavelength, one oscillation or AC cycle of that would be at 1600 kilohertz, it, this would be 187 meters long. At the low end of the band, at 550 kilohertz, this wavelength's going to be 545 meters long. It's going to stretch out over 545 meters in one cycle. Now the most effective antennas, or the most commonly used antennas, let's put it that way, are half a wavelength long, like a dipole antenna with a feed line. Even your TV antennas that have all the, you know, the log periodic style antennas, this is half a wavelength at say channel 2, and as you go up in frequency, you know, channel 2 I think was 54 megahertz, somewhere around there, 56, I forget exactly. But this would have been half a wavelength at the lowest frequency, and as you went up in channel sequence and you got closer and closer up you know, to 400 megahertz or what have you with the UHF bands, all of these would be shorter and shorter and shorter to match the wavelength. Again, we're talking generalities here. Relax. So half a wavelength. Now, a dipole antenna isn't a very useful antenna on a car, so they use a vertical antenna. Now this represents a vertical antenna over ground, and in the case of the car, the ground would be the body of the car. And this reflection off the ground mimics the other half of the half wave antenna. So you have a quarter wave here and a quarter wave here, but it's actually reflected in this direction. But let's not get into the technicalities here. The shortest practical antenna is a quarter wavelength when it's a vertical. Well, at 1600 kilohertz or 187 meters, a quarter wavelength is 46.75 meters or 153 feet. And if you think that's tough, we cut down to the 550 kilohertz region. Quarter wavelength for that's 136.25 meters or 447 feet. Let's see you drive around with a 447 foot antenna on your fender. So in reality, the antenna you're driving around with is down here somewhere. It is picking out a microscopic, minuscule amount of the signal off the air. And it's the job of all of the amplifiers, all of these tuned circuits, to take that minuscule piece of signal that that tiny little antenna on your fender is catching and amplify it to give you a usable signal. And that's why I say those antennas are tiny. They're practically microscopic at 540 or 550 kilohertz. It's a, that's a tiny little antenna to be pulling that signal off the air. And again, physics, physics professors, take a chill pill, relax. We're talking perspective here. Okay, I've got everything hooked up. I've had a devil of a time blocking out enough uh, radio signal to, uh, and I'm still receiving. I've got shielded cables everywhere. I've been grounding equipment to equipment, trying to eliminate noise leaking into this set. No matter what I do, I, I can't fully eliminate <laughs> the local radio station. So we're going to have to work around it while we're doing the alignment. This set is just incredibly sensitive. Right now, uh, well, let's back up here a little bit. I said that I keep getting wrapped around the axle with this. I've, I've done so many radios over the years using tuning capacitors, and it's been so long since I've been inside of a set that has this type of tuning that I keep wanting to go to the wrong place to do the alignment. I gotta keep stopping and saying, no, 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 it's reversed. We're going to trim our oscillator at the high end of the band using the inductor, which is going to be, in this case, H, and then we'll go down to the low end of the band, the low frequency portion of the band, and use the trimmer capacitor, and we're going to try to net the two frequencies in so that at 1600 and 600, the dial pointer lines up so that it's going to be fairly 
uniform across the band or fairly correct all the way across the band. I don't know how you want to... It tracks correctly. How's that? We're also going to have to tune this circuit, this plate circuit of the RF amplifier to peak that. I'm going to peak that to the same two points. And then normally you move down in frequency, say, to 1400 kilohertz and we'll peak the antenna tuning circuit. This gets peaked the best we can do here in the shop using the uh, dummy antenna of 75 picofarads. And when the car radio gets installed into the car and you plug the actual real antenna in, this trimmer capacitor is accessible through the bottom of the case of the radio. There's a hole, an access hole on the bottom side of it and you just tune to a weak station near 1400 kilohertz and tweak that in for the maximum volume on the weakest signal you can find and you're good to go. That From that point on when you tune all of these slugs will tune together and the relationship should stay so that you're getting the maximum performance out of the radio all the way down the line. So we're going to start here. I'm at 1600 kilohertz and right now I got four microvolts going in and let's see if we can find that. There it is. There's four microvolts going in. I'm going to lower that. I'm going to attenuate it. Well, let's get it dialed in first of all. This being the high end of the band, I'm going to go after J. No, I'm going to go after K, uh, K, excuse me, eight. I need new glasses. H, that's an H. I said it was an H earlier. H, which is our oscillator, which is this guy right here. So I'm going to tune up because 1600 is up here, and we're going to chase that. go there it is every time I try to do this with the screwdriver the barb pushes in there we go so there's 1600 and I'll also want I'll turn the volume down here I'll also want to go after J, which is this guy, which is our uh, tuned plate circuit. And if I swing the camera over here a little bit, so that pretty much matches. Now I'm going to go down to 600 kilohertz. down the other end of the band and find out where it is and it's still low it's still down here we need to move this up so now I'm going to trim the oscillator which will be patter E which is on the back Ugh, I can't get near the thing without it picking me up time I get anywhere near the radio. Come on, get on the screw. Going to add a little more attenuation here. going to do the same with the plate circuit of the amplifier.
So that's pretty much on 600. Now I'm going to go back up to 1600. Top end of the band. Let's see where we are. That pretty much stayed there. I'm trying to get everything in frame here. That pretty much stayed. It might be off a tiny fraction. Let's see if we get any improvement. I don't think we will. And again, I'm kind of guessing at this set because I don't have the alignment information but I think we're going to be successful here anyway every time I touch the bar I disturb the other <laughs> it is so touchy Okay. There we go. We got a peek out of it that time. We got a big gain out of it that time. We brought the RF amplifier up a lot. Let me turn the power down here. There's one and a half microvolts. That's a really tiny signal. One and a half microvolts. That is way down. And we're pulling it out very reliably. So we'll go back down to 600 kilohertz. Uh, frequency 600 kilohertz. And we're right on the money there, but let's tweak the patter on the uh, RF amplifier. Let's see if we can get any improvement on this end. Oh yeah. So we picked up a lot of signal there. Now I'm going to go back up to 1600 and see if we can realize any gains up this end. And it's a matter of going back and forth, back and forth, moving that slug back and forth and capacitor back and forth until we get the best gain out of both ends that we can with the amplifier. Because we know the oscillators are right. Because we're on our two points here. Now it's a matter of playing with the amplifiers. Dialing that in. Like already they have war in Ukraine. Fourteen, they seize Prime Minister. Six hundred. Just going to keep going back and forth, back and forth. I'm not going to sit here for the next 20 minutes boring you to death, but that's the process. On the high end of the band, we tune the slugs. On the low end of the band, we tune the caps. And we keep looking for the best gain and the best general alignment that we can find at both ends. So when I've got that tweaked in, I'll okay. be back. You can probably still hear the tone in there. It isn't a real strong signal, but that's half a microvolt coming out of the signal generator, actually 0.473, not even a, a whole microvolt. 
That's pretty amazing for a radio from 1947 to be hearing half a microvolt. And you can hear off the air signals leaking in in the background even though the antenna is shunted out by the signal generator. So I'm pretty happy with that sensitivity. Now I'm going to go down to 1400, give or take. Well, actually, we'll go between 120. I guess that'll be 120, 130, 140. Well, there's a station there. Let's go in between the stations. And uh, we'll try peaking the antenna. I've got to get in front of the camera here to swing the signal generator down here and find well, this. Well, this has been fun. I. Uh, mentioned a couple times I don't have the specific frequencies to bring this one to and when I got through aligning it on 1600 and 600 where my peaks with my oscillator and my RF amplifier were the same when I tuned down the band this part of the band was horribly off so I kept coming down coming down and now I've got it peaked at 600 and 1200 and everything's running pretty linear up and down the band and my slugs have moved out quite a ways without having the specific information if you look at some of the different uh, sets they'll say you know with the gang all the way in one direction you should have a quarter of an inch of the ferrite sticking out of the coil as a starting place I don't have a starting place so I'm guessing but I've been waiting for the battery to go dead because the power supply is unplugged and instead of the battery going dead the memory card ran out. That was pretty rude of it. Um, where was I? Oh, we're... That's uh, 1.5 microvolts and that's half a microvolt. And Where'd that new noise come from? Let me try turning off a light. I turned on a couple of lights here. Okay, I'll leave those off. Um, we're hearing a tone at half a microvolt. Now my brand new ICOM IC7300 ham radio that I have only had a few months, its AM sensitivity for 10 dB signal to noise is 12 microvolts. Now I know we're not at 10 dB signal to noise right here, but let's go up a little bit. There's one. There's four microvolts, 4.7 microvolts, and that's 15. I mean, this thing's comparable with my brand new IC7300 for the AM performance. Of course, on sideband and upper frequencies, higher frequencies, it gets a lot better than that. It gets down to a couple of microvolts. But on AM, in this frequency range, this is right right on par with my brand new radio. I'm pretty impressed for 1947. Okay, uh, I'm on 1400 kilohertz and I'm gonna try to peak the antenna. And I just make sure I'm not stepping on anything here. So that's definitely gonna be K. Let's see if it comes up any. There it is. Yes, it is there. That's an improvement. On the high end of the band. Every time I touch it, if I try to do it with a screwdriver, I push the bar back, and every time I grab this, it moves everything. And just putting my hand in there brings the noise level up. But that did, that went up, so. I'd say that alignment is pretty much done. The only thing that remains to be done is when it's in the car with its own antenna, 
that trimmer on the bottom will have to be tweaked for maximum signal at 1400. Whew, that's been quite a journey. I was a little bit nervous about going in there without having the uh, proper alignment information, but it worked out okay in the end, and I'm very happy with that. I guess all we've got left to do now is I'm going to pull this thing out of the case, sand it up, I'll pull the rubber off the front, take some pictures, uh, make sure he's got all the information of exactly how the staples went in, and we'll put some paint on this. We're waiting on the vibrator to come in. I've got to get some sheet metal or some perforated metal to make the backing for this. Uh, and uh, once that's done, once the vibrator's in, once we have the back made and the paint's done, we can ship this back to him and he can put it in the car. And oh, by the way, <clears throat> here are the vehicles that he's got. And uh, I got to tell you, I've got some serious envy. I'd love to have that Oldsmobile. In fact, I know he's forgotten already, but uh, you know he's got a little memory problem, and he told me that uh, he was going to give me that car as soon as the radio was done for the Chevy. So that I thought that was pretty nice of the guy. <laughs> and I'm sure he's forgotten that comment by now. Uh, so that's it for this one for tonight. I'm the Radio Mechanic. Thanks for riding along with me. It's been a lot of fun figuring this one out. It's been a challenge, but it's been fun. And uh, as soon as the thing's painted and the vibrator's in, we'll do a brief video to show you how well it performs with the solid-state vibrator and how it looks with a coat of paint squirted on it. Take care for now. See ya.